Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to today's Reddit quickie from the subreddit HFY called The Gunslinger's Debt. Written by Regal Legal Eagle. The link to the original will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. All he could taste was dirt. Dry, coarse dirt. He wasn't sure how long he'd been like this either. As he tried to lift his arms up, he felt dirt shifting around him. It took a bit, but he slowly clawed through the dirt until he could feel it break through the soil and into the air. Then he began to kick and twist his legs as he tried to drag more dirt away from his face. When he finally cleared away the dirt from his eyes, he opened them to see a full moon hanging up in the night sky before him. Slowly but surely, he pushed and twisted and wiggled to dig himself up out of the ground until he could finally roll out of the shallow grave. For several minutes he lay there, gasping hard as he tried to catch his breath. He was tired, more tired than he'd ever been. He wasn't even sure that he had the energy to push himself up to his feet. His lips were dry and cracked, his tongue felt like sandpaper in his mouth. But he needed to get up. He had to get up. Even as he tried to push down with his arms, he wobbled and gave out as he flopped back down into the dirt. Groaning in pain and dismay, he tried once more. But again, he couldn't do it and lay on the dusty top of the plateau. He closed his eyes but tried not to fall asleep. He wasn't sure if he could wake up again this time. He just lay there listening. The far-off call of a sweeper, a buzz of some elk beetles, and even the chittering of some lava lizards. It was peaceful here. Too peaceful. He couldn't give in to the gentle noise trying to lull him back into the endless sleep. So, he tried to push himself up once more. He got partway up and then collapsed yet again, as he let out a frustrated scream, which used most of his remaining energy. Once more, all he could do was taste dirt. He wasn't sure how long he lay there, his ribs cracking and groaning with every breath. But then, with his great surprise, a canteen dropped in front of his face. He flinched a bit though, all that he could do was move his face. As he reached out to take it, I paused and looked up. Before him was a figure that caught him off guard. He wore a black cassock with a red trim and a long crimson sash wrapped around his waist along with a pistol. Even religious folk carried irons around here. What was a father doing out here? Though he'd never seen a red before, was he a cardinal or even a saint? What will it cost? He asked as he slowly closed his dirty cut up hands around the canteen. The water shall cost nothing. Water always costs something out here, friend, he croaked out, coughing a little bit more dirt. It shall cost you but a moment of time to listen to a proposal then. The gunslinger hesitated and then unscrewed the cap before taking a first small sip, then a bigger sip, and finally he started just to drink it all. The water was clean and clear as crystal. It was so cold that he could swear that he was drinking from the snow well. It was so cold it almost hurt his parched, dry throat as he drank it down. It was like the water was breathing new life into him, with all the aches and pains in his body faded away. When the canteen had run dry, he finally had the energy to slowly push himself up onto his feet. Though he felt a bit shaky, still he tried to get a look at the figure's face, but for some reason he couldn't. It was like his head was covered in a dark shroud and he couldn't be pierced by the light of the full moon above. It looks like you walked into an ambush. That it does, the gunslinger slid, looking around the top of the plateau. The bodies of the marauders that he had slain were gone, but that wasn't unusual. What was unusual was that it even bothered to toss him into a shallow grave. He had heard that they liked to use up the bodies as fertilizer, but there weren't any plants here for his body to sustain. Did they take my guns? Your rifle, but not your pistols. The figure extended a long, rather thin arm and pointed when the gunslinger noticed the black gloves in the priest's hands. Turning, he slowly staggered over to the rock figure that pointed to, and sure enough there was an iron being covered in rocks. He clicked open the cylinder and spun it out as he pulled the case free. It had one bullet left and it had the same name carved into the side. A gift 
from his son, so that he'd always be holding a bullet with his name on it. To keep him safe, he tucked it into his chest pocket in his heart. What's the proposition? It's simple. I'll give you a new glider and a bullet. The gunslinger looked around the plateau, and he already knew that his glider would be gone. But not even marauders would leave behind a good bluestone glider, if not to use, then to tear apart for the bits inside. And what will this cost me? The figure was quiet for a few seconds, as if considering the cost before it finally spoke once more. Everything. The gunslinger had a feeling that it would cost him that. He looked down at the gun in his hand and thought about his family. So far away, so vulnerable without him. Deal. He extended his hand, and then the figure slowly raised his in turn. As the gunslinger reached out to shake the hands, he gasped softly, as just how cold the figure's hands were. How could they be that cold? Especially with gloves on. He shivered a little, and he felt like the line of frost ran down his spine, and the figure let go. Reaching down to the holster waist, the figure pulled free a bullet and handed it to the gunslinger, who quickly loaded it into his pistol before tucking. And the glider? He asked, and the figure reached up and the glider straps off of his back. The straps had been so perfectly black that they blended in with the figure's cassock, and he couldn't see it. Take mine. I have more. Then the figure unslung the glider and swung it around to hand it to the gunslinger, and he was taken aback to the look of it. He'd seen a few fancy ones before, usually brass with inlaid gems and stained glass. But this looked like the main casing was carved from a single giant skull, a flying serpent based on the teeth jutting out from the bottom. It was beautiful in a haunting way. How will you collect? When will you collect? I shall collect when and where it's appropriate. Of course, the gunslinger sighed. For a moment, he shook his head. Doesn't matter. The deal was still worth it. I'll see you around then. He was about to turn and walk away when the figure spoke again. You should take the canteen. You might need it. It's empty, the gunslinger said with a shrug. Is it? The figure asked that, and the gunslinger hesitated, and then he reached down to pick up the canteen once more. But when he did, he straightened up, and the figure was gone. He looked all around the plateau, but he couldn't see any signs of him, just the remains of the marauder camp that he'd been hired to clear. The camp that had been waiting for him. But where where they had been waiting for him truly? Or anyone? It was hard to say. After opening up the canteen once more, he found more water inside of it. Confused, but thankful, for the mystery that the gunslinger took to be more deep gulps and splashed some on his face to try and wash away a little of the dirt. With that done, he pulled the strap of the canteen over his shoulder and then reached down into the dirt of his grave. After a moment of digging, he pulled it out of his hat, batting head against his leg to knock off most of the dirt before setting it on his head. After that, he looked around the plateau, trying to get his bearings. The distant horizon was starting to glow in the orange-red that was the coming of the new dawn. And once he finally saw the top of the silver sun, he set it off the back. Facing away from it, he ran straight off the edge of the plateau and jumped as he reached the edge. Triggering the wings, they snapped out of the glider and strapped to his back, and as he fell, the lava below caught one of the many updrafts to carry him back up to dry land, and the next pillar in the sea of the lava ran across it, and jump once more. He ran, jumping and diving off the edge from pillar to pillar. He was no stronger at crossing the broken spires. Sometimes he could catch a longer draft, spinning through the air as the winds carried him further. The pack was lighter than he had expected, given the size, it hardly seemed to weigh upon him at all. Though that might just be his mind set onto a new distant task that he was running towards. Once, long ago, he had relished this sort of travel. To almost fly free as a bird, to twist in the drift between the currents of the air that carried his wings. And that was nothing but long-dead memories in the depths of his mind now. The sun at his back began, began to climb higher as he ran, the flat barren plateaus and the spires giving him no protection from the heat that began to steadily rise. 
Even when he'd jump and dive, the winds coursing around him were hot swells of lava from below and did little to cool him off. But he didn't care. His lips would crack and his tongue ran dry all over again. But he wouldn't stop him. Not now. Not this time. The sun was high beating down upon him when he finally saw the smoke in the distance. Smoke there where there shouldn't be any. He adjusted the course a little, though he didn't have a change much. It was one of the larger plateaus in the area. A small, dry pond at the center surrounded by bigger boulders and rocks that filled with the rain season. Some gnarled, twisted bone trees surrounding the pond, twisted and evil as they looked he'd seen their beauty and splendor when they bloomed. But the next rain wasn't for months. As he got closer, he could hear the distant sound, a crack and a pop of rifles, a boom of a cannon and a snap and a whistle of a marauder of starves. He picked up his pace a little, wondering if there were ones who had ambushed him. Perhaps his journey would be over already. When he landed on the edge of the spy, he began to creep between the boulders, hoisting his pistol in his hand, aware that he only had two bullets. One, really, since he didn't dare use the one with his name on it yet. He could hear the shouting ahead and the battle raged on while he navigated the maze of boulders that shielded the dry pond bed from the middle. He rounded a rock and then placed himself against it as he saw a marauder before him crouching behind the rock up ahead. It would peek over the top, tilting its staff up before it would snap and whistle and a blue bolt shot forth then hunker back down to wait for the crystal set in the shaft to spin back into place. The gunslinger never trusted the damn things. A gun he could understand, but that thing. He wasn't the only one to be stumped by them, of course. Ever since the old kingdoms had first set foot on the new world, they had been beset by marauders. No one knew what they were. They scurried and crawled in every many different forms and ways, some on all fours, others on six, though many on just two, with the odd numbers of appendages either way, small arms of what looked to be amputated limbs sticking out at odd angles. They twisted, broken faces, behind their intricate masks, stitched together with the hair of the humans that they killed. How could one define a species that seemingly had no set order, size, or build? The raids and the attacks had been light at first, and the first landings of the early colonies. But once the settlers had discovered bluestone and the properties that it held, like the ability to lift ships out of the water and above the lava, well, that had led to the explosion of growth and far more marauders down from the north. No one knew where they came from. No expedition to the crown had ever returned. But for now, the gunslinger was less focused on the history and more on the immediate threat before him. This one had two arms and two legs, or at least a thick wool and a poncho and wrappings that were cut with holes with two arms and two legs. There might be smaller ones underneath. He waited for it to peek over the top of the rock once more, and he rushed closer. It and just fired when he was behind it, yanking back hard on its black hair and jamming the pistol under its chin as he pulled the trigger. The blue blood and the green brains splattered across the gunslinger, and it was quickly ignored as it kicked the body out from behind the rock so that he could duck behind it and use it for cover for himself. Holstering his pistol, he then grabbed the marauder's staff, letting the crystal spin back into place while he peered over the top of the rock to see what was going on. Ahead, almost in the middle of the pond, was a frigate, crashed hard from the looks of things, cracked and broken into the ground, leaving many heavily to the side. Looked to be a wood one with a few iron plates slapped on the side. Not a proper iron ship, then. Soldiers were huddled around and firing in all directions as more marauders peppered them from the blue bolts from the rocks and the trees around them. In the center, he could see the officer with more courage than sense holding the stars and strikers aloft in her hand and a pistol in the other as she directed fire. Even now, she wasn't ready to let the old red, white, and black fall to the earth. Out front was a cannon that they had apparently salvaged, but the crew was taking too much fire to get out and load it again. The gunslinger looked at his new staff and saw that the crystals were finally lined up. He turned to his left and waited to see another marauder mask pop up from behind the rock. 
When he did, he thumbed a small gem at the center of the stove, and he felt a jerk in his hands as it snapped, and the whistle of blue bolt shot straight out and into the marauder's face. There was a hiss and a flash from the impact as the mask shattered it to a thousand tiny pieces, and the face behind it was burned into a charred lump. Then he ducked back down. He reached out and gripped one of the crystals with his left hand and hissing out as his flesh burned right before he turned it forward faster to bring them into alignment yet again. Leaning back again once more and saw another mask for a moment before he fired, yet again turning Marauder's face into a charred lump. But now they realized what was going on there was a hissing and a clicking, even some loud whistles and piercing wails as they communicated what was going on. He kept low and moved away from the rock behind when, and he heard some more snaps and whistles as bolts slammed into the rock that he'd been behind. Moving around to the left, he circled some bigger boulders and peeked around to see a cluster of marauders in the distance. These must be the ones suppressing the cannon, he figured, as he could see them working in tandem to always have a staff ready to fire, as each one would pop out in sequence. He needed to time this right. Before he could get one shot in, then the others could remain and focus on him, but he'd never be able to get another shot off without one of them being ready for it. So he watched him closely for a minute. Four arms on the left, twin tail next to him, blue mask further right, and the red legs that started charging his staff again. Then he pulled out the cover and ran straight at the cluster. He resisted the urge to yell, since that would give him away, and he managed to be nearly upon the first marauder when he turned and saw the gunslinger. The red leg hissed and licked in surprise, but the gunslinger was jamming the tip of his captured staff into the marauder's gut as he thumped the gem. This time, instead of a snap and a whistle, it was a snap and a loud, wet pop. But the marauder's torso exploded in a shower of blue blood and guts. But the gunslinger once again ignored that and grabbed the red leg staff, swiftly levelling it at the blue mask and thumbing the trigger to shoot the next marauder in the back. Four arms and twin tails were aware of the surprise attack by now, and rolled off the top of the rock to face him directly. He spun the staff around in his hands to smash it across twin tails skull as the metal on the wood shattered, staggering. The creature as he jumped up to grab the blue mask staff off of the rock where the dead marauder had dropped it. Four arms was lunging at him now, and the gunslinger barely had time to bring the new staff up and knock aside the creature's claws that swiped at his face. It hissed at him, and the mask lunged once more. Simply tackling to the ground then, the gunslinger grunted and grasped as he was knocked to the ground beneath the marauder. Holding up the staff between them to try and keep it off, wincing as the smell of its rancid breath and puff of black air escaped its mask. Behind four arms, the twin tails had recovered, shaking his head and adjusting his cracked mask as he raised his staff. But with four arms on top of the gunslinger, he didn't have a clear shot. Hissing and clicking, he was no doubt telling four arms to get off if so he had a shot. When four arms looked back, the gunslinger used that moment of hesitation to his advantage. He shoved the hard with the staff, twisting as he did so and slipped the staff up between the marauder's two left arms and aimed it at twin tails when he thumbed the gem. As it snapped and whistled, the bolt slammed into the marauder's chest, sending him tumbling back. With most of four arms bulk off of him, the gunslinger rolled away, reaching out far as he could with the marauder's tangled with his feet. Forearms hissed and the gunslinger gasped as he felt claws digging in flesh into his legs, through his pants, but he grabbed the staff twin tails had dropped and rolled over, aiming it between his legs, jamming the staff into Forearms' face before firing. Much like the red leg, instead of a snap, it was a whistle this time, and it was a snap and a wet pop, as Forearms' head exploded, coating the gunslinger in yet more blue blood and green-gray brains. The heat of the explosion singeing his legs a bit, as well as causing him to hiss in pain. But he pushed through it, kicking the corpse free and his legs getting the behind the rock, and they were using his cover. You cannon should be clear, he called out. Who the freck are you? he heard a voice call out. Doesn't freaking matter. Load it, load it now before the ogre returns. Was that what had drowned the frigate? 
the gunslinger peeked over the top of the rock and saw the soldiers rushing up to load the cannon, even as he heard the bellowing roar of the ogre from the outside of the circle of bone trees. There was a soldier just at the edge of the trees who looked up and screamed as the gunslinger saw a massive gnarled hand and the unlucky bastard into a tree, turning his brown and red uniform into mostly red. It stomped into the clearing, four large chubby legs ending and stubby feet. What wasn't pinkish boiled lead and flesh was covered beneath painted wrappings and a massive mask. Considering how many hairs were needed to stitch it together, it must have killed hundreds of people by now. Only a single giant purple eye was exposed from the top of the mask as it bellowed out, two fat arms raising to the sky as it began to charge down towards the frigate. Thankfully, the gun crew was faster though, and the loader had it just cleared the mouth of the gun when another crewman yanked on the cord to fire it. The cannonball shot straight up and true, and it slammed through the ogre's front right leg, amputating it at the knee before slamming into the back of the right leg, smashing it into a twisted mess of bone, sinew, and flesh. The ogre screamed as it toppled over its eye, flashing as a purple beam shot out, wildly cutting through some of the down frigate sails and rigging. The soldiers cried and cursed as they dove and ran for cover to avoid the falling debris. But the gunslinger ignored them as he ran forward. He knew that the ogre might be down, but it wasn't out, and his staff wouldn't cut it. Tossing aside the marauder weapon, he ran towards the soldier who'd been smashed into the bow tree. Thankfully, his carbine hadn't been crushed in the blow and the gunslinger grabbed it, rolling onto the two of the three whistling bolts sailed through the air just where he had been. As he came up to his feet, he aimed at the marauder across the clearing and pulled the trigger. He was rewarded with a splash of blue in the air as the marauder's head snapped back. Then he worked the lever on the carbine and ran towards the downed ogre as it twisted and wrist trying to push itself back up. It was trying to reposition its head and the cannon still was being reloaded when he jumped up onto its back, firing point blank into the back of its head. The bullet lodged deep into the back of its skull, but it just made the ogre howl in anger and jerk around, fat hands trying to reach back and swat him off. He ducked under the stubby fat fingers and gripped the back of the mask for support, letting it swing blindly a few more times before working the lever and shooting it in the back of the skull once more. This time, it was as it bellowed in anger and pain and flopped hard to the side, which sent the gunslinger flying off. But he rolled as he sailed through the air and came up on his feet. The ogre tried to look at him at that moment, but the cannon crew had other plans. Fire! The captain yelled, before the roar of the cannon filled the air, and the cannonball succeeded when the bullets had failed. It punched a hole straight through the ogre's mask, shattering it into pieces that went flying as the cannonball tore through the flesh and bone of its skull. It didn't even go all the way through, but the monstrosity slumped to the side as it was dead just the same. There were cheers from the soldiers as the remaining marauders on the far side of the clearing began to run, skitter and scramble away. But the captain just raised a pistol and shouted, Quit cheering and shoot, you idiots! The gunslinger was ready ahead of her, and he ran after them, working the lever on the carbine, raising it to his shoulder and firing, and then repeating the action in an almost mechanical fashion. One more marauder, two, three, four, click. He looked down at the carbine and sighed as it was out of bullets. He used all seven as the soldiers ran after the fleeing marauders to give chase. He looped back around the wrecked frigate and began to pick up bullets of one of the other dead soldiers. That's government property. She looked up to see the captain who stood over him, her pistol holstered but the flag still in the other hand as it fluttered in the breeze. It had a few cinch marks from the marauder bolts but it was still flying. Should I give it back? The gunslinger asked as he stopped his rummaging. The captain looked around the clearing for a moment as the wounded were dragged into the shade of the wreck so that the sore bones could look them over. Freck it. We lose property out here plenty, she shrugged. What are you doing out here, gunslinger? Can't be a bounty for a hundred miles in any direction, or more. I wasn't out here for a bounty, he mentioned as he went back to pulling bullets from the dead man's satchel and tucking them into his own belt. 
There was a nest, and I went to clear it. Half a day east, they were expecting me. He nodded his head and rose up, walking to another body and started rummaging through the gear. Well, that does explain why you're way the freck out here, without a night pack. I still want to know who the hell would pay you to clear out a nest here. And why just one? This place is littered with them, the captain asked as he worked. I wasn't paid. I was told that this area was supposed to be safe. He replied as she let out a short laugh. Safe my ass. If you mean to say that there haven't been any attacks, that's true. But it's only because they've got a war chief somewhere gathering them up. And a man like you doesn't do anything without pay. I know your type. Marauders aren't your specialty, are they? You're behaving like a homesteader. The gunslinger paused at that and then resumed looting the body before him as she laughed once more. <laughs> a gunslinger turned homesteader. Out here. You can't be that dumb. Cheap land, grand opportunities, unclaimed wealth, untapped potential, a prospector I could trust. Thought I could trust, he muttered before he stopped and raised up. He had enough bullets for now and he moved to check the marauder corpses nearby. Have you seen any with the brown talisman? He walked over to the nearest corpse, turning it over and looking for talismans. They wore little bits of metal and shiny things into the wrappings under their ponchos, but they all had a prized talisman that they kept. They were little planks of some strange material no one could seem to find elsewhere, studded with bits of metal all across them. Most were green, but he'd seen red, blue, and last night, brown. The bodies here had green talismans, and it seemed as he was tossed the religious artifacts aside. These are the first that we fought on ground, the captain mentioned. Outposts saw distress flares from the fort heading early yesterday morning, a day after he had left. We were sent to find out what was up, but obviously we didn't make it. Look, you helped us out of a bad spot. If you wait for another ship, there should be along in a day or two, and I'll make sure to have a berth waiting for you. We'll get back to the fountain spire at least. I can't wait and I'm not going south, the gunslinger said as he began to walk west once more. You're crazy. You're so invested in a sandpit. You can't be so stubborn as to try and save it. The marauders are out in force. They might have sealed off the heartbreak pass. If they did, there's no getting through for a day to the north or south. She followed after him as he walked to the edge of the spire. I know... His pistol was freshly loaded and the holster full of bullets as he turned to look back at her and he reached the tip of his brim of his hat. The gesture she returned to him before he faced west and jumped. Carbine gripped tight in his hands as he dove. He picked up by a hot winds once more when his glider wings snapped out. The sun beat down on him through the rest of the day. He wasn't sure how long the canteen would last, even though every time he opened it, it felt full. So he took small sips each time, rationing what might possibly never end. But he didn't want to risk being a glutton, only to be dry when he needed it most. The miles dragged on, the hours passed with his constant trek west. The sun curled over the head before it began to dip back into the horizon. Even as it was shown on his face, it had a squint to avert his gaze and didn't stop moving. As his legs ached and muscles began to beg for rest, he would keep moving along each plateau to dive down yet again, to be carried by the strong air currents lifting up by the lava between the spires. He could see the heartbreak pass in the distance as the sun illuminated the distant gap in the ridge of the taller plateaus and spires. It was too far from the edge to get enough of a wind to fly over so travellers had to walk down one of two gaps, which, when viewed from a distance, looked like two halves of a heart, broken down the middle. As the sun finally sank behind the horizon and the sky was left orange as its departure, he looked for the telltale signs of fires that any encamped marauders would be having. But he saw none. While the shadow of night began to take over, the land and the sky grew even darker, the stars came out shining bright above him, far brighter than the city that he'd grown up in. He'd always loved to lay back and stare up at them late into the night while the moon crawled across the sky. But tonight, he didn't even glance up. By the time he finally made it to the more solid row of rocks that blocked his path, the sun had set completely, 
but the light of the full moon gave him enough to see by. He wasn't quite sure what path to take, the left or the right, but as he walked closer he saw something they chose for him, a nomad woman who was sitting on a boulder beside the left path. He wasn't a fool, he hadn't stumbled across her by chance. She was letting him see her. Even as he walked closer, he could see that the pearlescent glow of her eyes, like a cat's eyes, when they were caught the reflection of the light in the dark. She had a cloak wrapped around her body as the nomads always did. It was painted with a colored and a blend right, in with the rocks around her, in such a way that it was positive that if she covered her head and rifle, he'd never have seen her. But she wasn't covering up, she was sitting upright at the top end of a rifle poking up from under the cloak as well. Her curled horns of bone and deep blue sparkling opal flickering in the light of the full moon. Marauders had always used staves, but nobats had used rifles, and they liked them long, longer than they were tall. No one knew where they got them, or who made the bullets. They weren't like any that he'd seen made, and no one had ever seen any signs of a nomad forge. But they got them from somewhere. The gunslinger passed by the boulder, and the nomad was perched on top, for he reached up and gently tugged the brim of his hat as he passed. The nomad, for her part, dipped her head and her horns in a moment, and then she shifted, stretching out on top of the boulder as the cloak fluttered for a moment, and then settled atop her as she positioned her rifle facing east. Even though he knew exactly where she was, she was still hard to see. The marauders would be coming through this pass so long as she was there. He wasn't sure why he'd be earned the gift, but he was thankful for it. On he walked throughout the night, ignoring the continued protests of his limbs and body as his muscles ached and groaned. He was too driven by his purpose to be stopped now by anything short of death itself. It took him half the night to walk the length of the pass, his only company the soft call of the owls that hunted what few rodents lived in such desolate and unwelcoming terrain. Once he reached the other side of the usual pattern of diving and climbing, the winds started fresh once more. He was getting closer now and he could feel the anxiety building within him with every step closer to his goal. By the time he finally rose to his back, he had gained miles more in his destination, never ceasing, just taking small sips of that cold, refreshing water from the canteen that the stranger had given him. Many a man might think hard on the gift, but not the gunslinger. He didn't have room for such concerns in his heart. Not now. As the sun began to steadily climb in the sky once more, he came across one of the few landmarks in this region of the Broken Spires, a blue mine that he'd seen in the distance. He wasn't sure what the miners could do to help, but at the very least they might have some news on the goings-on, or anyone that he could convince to come with, just in case his worst fears were realized. As he grew closer to the mine, he frowned as the setup of the buildings. It didn't look quite like any bluestone mine that he'd seen before. What was off about it? No guard towers, and he couldn't see any distinct barracks either. His frown deepened even as he caught the last hot gust of air to fly him up over the edge of the long spire the mine was positioned on. What sort of mine didn't have a barracks or guard towers? But he could see the white steam rising from the central shaft, which meant that it had to be operational. They didn't even have lookouts in case marauders or human bandits showed up. Where was the singing? It wasn't like they could carry any half-decent tune, but he was used to hearing miners sing while they worked, to help pass the time if nothing else. But this place was quiet. Quiet enough to make the hairs rise in the back of his neck as he wondered what was wrong with this place. Until he finally saw the first of the workers moving wheelbarrows full a bluestone in the central shaft and processing mill. Clockers. That's why it was all wrong. He was the only living thing here. Even as he walked into the center of the compound, the clockers all around him just kept working without paying any attention. The mechanical clockwork bodies never tiring from simple labor strains like men. Most of these didn't even have wind-up keys in the back, but some new models he wasn't familiar with. He'd heard the cogs go on and on about the great inventor himself and his divine vision. 
But the gunslinger, he'd met the man once, he wasn't a great inventor. He was a nervous little man with broken glasses who had been swept up into something greater than himself. The question was, why were clockers mining bluestone? Wasn't there laws against using clockers for manual labor over able-bodied living people? There had been unrest until the riots and over the very issue if the papers and wires from the cities were right. But he didn't have time for that. Hey, I need help, he said to the nearest few clockers, and they stopped in their tracks. The mechanical heads turned to face him, deep blue eyes examining him. It started a chain reaction through the entire mine, as all stopped and their work and began to gather around him. The gunslinger looked around and nervously, once he was surrounded, for finally one of the clockers opened its hinged jaw and spoke. I help. He stepped forward and pulled a small piece of foot from the set of before the gunslinger, and then stepped forward. I help. It picked another piece from its foot and set it beside the first piece. On it went as they would all step forward, pulling a piece of themselves off and setting it into a place with the others. The gunslinger stood there watching as they began to build a clocker before him. Each of the others giving what they could spare without sacrificing anything that they couldn't. It was built up piece by piece over the span of a couple minutes. It looked different from the others too, he noted. The body seemed bulkier, the arms and legs heavier and more robust. Finally, it stood and hunched over and missing only a head. That's when they parted and they saw the foreman. It slowly walked forward on six legs, four long multi-jointed arms extending from its torso. Then watching him with three very intricate heads, he could see the steam pouring out from the back as it needed more than just bluestone to function, apparently. It reached up and carefully disconnected the middle head, setting it into place on the new clocker that they had made. The four long arms moved over the new clocker to tighten the screws and check the gears until it was satisfied. Then, another clocker stepped forward with a chunk of raw bluestone the size of the glancinger's clenched fist. They opened a panel in the back of its chest and set it inside before closing the panel. With that, the rest of the clockers backed up slowly and raised their arms to the sky. Then, they began to sing. Except, it wasn't singing, it was chimes, like those in a clock. They chimed together in harmony to sing of a wordless song that made the hairs on the back of the gunslinger's neck and arms raise further. There was a soft clacking in the air as the song seemed to reach a climax. And then the clocker in the middle jerked and popped for a moment before it opened its deep blue eyes and stood straight. I help. It crackled after a moment and then the circle of clockers split before them and the gunslinger quickly walked past with his new helper. The others began to sing a different song now with their chimes. It was a sad and mournful, a ballad of loss for one of the kin as he turned and began to follow after the gunslinger who didn't even utter a word of thanks to the clunkers. He needed to continue. He hadn't expected his request for help to be taken so long. Once they were at the edge of the spire and the song of the mining clunkers was beyond the hearing, he looked to his new associate once more. It was certainly bulkier than the others, more complex. I hope you can fly, he muttered. It looked at him for a moment and then the next spire before them across the chasm. It sank down then, crouching and pulling itself in as if to make itself as small as possible. The gunslinger frowned as he watched, hearing the clock a creak and groan for a moment as the gears spun and turned. Then it jumped into the air, shooting forward like a spring as it crossed the distance and landed on the next spire, only to learn and look at him. Hmph, was all the gunslinger could muster as he dove off the edge to catch the wind and rise up to join the clocker, waiting for him. With that, they began to travel more earnestly, the gunslinger using the glider to catch up the winds and the casts carrying him across between the spires, while the clocker would watch and jump once he knew just where the gunslinger would land. On they went as the sun continued to climb through the sky. The gunslinger was his destination, and he could see it now in the distance. A lone peak amongst the flat spires. While he couldn't see it yet, he knew his destination was nestled in a valley, and its shadow of the southern slope. 
a small homestead that lay claim to one of the most valuable resources that was in this place. Clear, clean water. The closer they got, the more the peak loomed over them, but it wasn't until the sun reached a peak high above their heads that they finally reached the base of the mountain. The gunslinger clicked the wings on his glider shut, knowing that he wouldn't need it any more. He thought about how best to approach it, and then the thin, wispy trees that dotted the land before him, blocking his view of the homestead he knew to be nestled further into the valley. But then he heard the crack of a rifle and a snap and a whistle of stars, and any hesitation fled. His legs and arms burned as his unrelenting travel, but still he ran forwards then, pushing forward by the drive that wouldn't cease. Not now, not so close. The clocker clanked along behind him, keeping pace with the gunslinger as he ran between the trees. He saw the fence that marked the start of the homestead. It was wide open, but there were two marauders around keeping watch. The talisman hanging from their belts were brown. He raised his carbine to his shoulder and fired. The first marauder's head snapped back and fell to the ground. The other spun and lifted its staff, but the gunslinger fired again, and the one dropped dead as well. How can I help? the clocker asked, even as the gunslinger ran forward once more. Kill them all. Was the only thing that he could say. Not bothering to stop and wait for the clocker, it took but a moment, and then the mechanical man changed, his left arm collapsing into itself to form a sharp blade, while the right seemed to fortify itself and the hand turned into a head of a hammer. Even his head sank into his chest a little, while the metal casing rose up so that its eyes were exposed. Then it ran to catch up with the gunslinger. The cattle were dead, the bodies scorched and burned by marauder bolts. But the gunslinger gave them no mind as he ran past their bodies in a low field where they lay. He staggered up on the slope from where he knew that he could see the homestead itself down below. The gunfire and snap whistle growing louder and more intense as he approached. But when he finally rose up to the top of the slope, he saw the scope of an attack. It wasn't a small band. There were twenty marauders at least. Some were lying dead red, blood steeping out between the ground where they lay while others tried to organize and push forward. And they were yelling. Red blood. He hadn't noticed it, but they too at the gate. It's a woman and kids. For freck's sakes, get in there, damn it. The gunslinger's eyes snapped to the figure furthest from him. The one next to the pump well that was supposed to bring the homestead so much prosperity. He knew that voice had belonged to someone he had never thought to see again. Someone that he shouldn't have seen again. Someone who should be dead. The scope of his betrayal was now made clear. His breathing became ragged for a moment until he finally remembered his way. The carbine pressed into his shoulder and he fired at the nearest fake marauder, shooting the man in the back of the head. Even as the first target fell, the lever and the aimed once more firing quickly to strike down another. Crap! Fire from the hill! He walked forward down the hill towards them, the assailants scattering to find place with cover, from both him and the homestead in the center of it all. He just walked down the hill, firing, working the lever, and firing again. Bolts whistled around the air around him, but he didn't flinch. He just kept walking and firing. When the carbine was out, he would hand load each bullet and fire. Man after man falling dead by fire, while he tried to run for cover, only to get struck by down by his carbine. Finally, his fortune ran dry as a bolt struck him in the shoulder. He let out a gasp of pain as it burned through his flesh. But he wasn't done yet. He loaded another bullet and fired on the marauder who'd struck him with it missed. His breath was growing more ragged, and he stumbled down the last few feet of the hill. He took two more shots at the attackers scattered around his homestead, but missed both shots as he finally had to duck behind a wagon at the edge of a clearing. He hissed in pain as he clutched the wounded shoulder, gasping as he moved his right arm a bit to try and work some life back into it. He set the carbine aside, realizing that he couldn't hold it anymore. Got him now, close in, go! That voice, he cursed that voice, and looked over the top of the wagon for a moment to see the six fake marauders closing in on him. Stars raised, he pulled his pistol free from his holster, his left hand wavering a bit and he gripped it. 
He could take two, maybe three with him, before they'd get him, and he figured. Is that a freaking clocker? He looked up the hill and saw the clocker rushing down. It's got a sword. The attackers shifted their aim up at the rushing clocker. The snap and the whistles, there were still stars filling the air with the fired. But the clocker ducked and weaved between them easily. The gunslinger stove out from behind the wagon just as the clocker reached the base of the hill and fired on the six who had approached him. One bullet caught a man in the chest while the next man caught another in the gut and the knee, making him scream in pain as he collapsed to the ground. By then the clocker was upon them. The gunslinger watched as he drove the blade straight through the man's chest of the first man only to pull free and the grace of a dancer to spin around the body and slam into the next in his face with a hammer hand. There was a deep crunch as bone and brains were splashed into the air. Kill the clocker! came the scream from all around as they tried to bring their staffs to bear. The third man managed to hit into the body with the bolt, but even as a metal body glowed with the heat and it hit step forward and drove the sword through his throat, skewering him on the spot. The gunslinger used the chance to scramble up to the barn. He needed to get to the well pump. The clocker continued its rampage while the gunslinger looped around. It began to take more hits, however, as it finished off the six in the open before running towards the others, who were further up spread around the well pump. With each bolt slamming into the clocker would stagger and the surge forward once more. It drove its sword through two more men, crushed the skulls of three more with its hammer before it finally struggled to stand up straight. There were only three fake marauders left now, besides the leader next to the well. With a wheeze and a whine, it slowly tried to stand up and the bolt hit it in the leg, which snapped free and sending the clocker collapsing to the ground. Using its hammer arm, it tried to drag itself forward, but two more bolts hit its torso, popping its chassis. With a burst of blue smoke, it ruptured, its soul leaving the body and the clocker finally stopped, eyes fading to black. Freaking finally, the leader growled, just as the gun went off behind him and one of the three remaining attackers toppled over, the back of his head opened up by a bullet. Spinning around, he saw the gunslinger behind the well pump now. They didn't stand a chance as the last two were shot where they stood. But the leader lunged forward, tackling the gunslinger to the ground. Damn you, damn you! How are you still alive? You're supposed to be dead. He screamed in the gunslinger's face as they wrestled on the ground. So, are you? The gunslinger yelled out in reply. Even as they grasped and wrestled, his opponent knocked the pistol from his hand. Why? Was all that he could ask then. Because you don't get to live this life. You don't get to. The fake marauder screamed into his face as the gunslinger knocked free the mask to reveal his face, scarred and burned, a far cry from the handsome figure that he was the last time the gunslinger had seen him. You were my brother, the gunslinger screamed then as the opponent slowly struggled to pull a knife free from his belt. The two men were locked in a contest of strength as the gunslinger desperately tried to turn the blade away from his chest where the other was trying to plunge it. I'd never be a brother to a son of a whore. The scarred, burnt man screamed in reply. Then the words stopped as they were both entirely focused on getting each other. The gunslinger began to gasp and wheezed. His body was tired from his trek. His shoulder weak from the wound, the knife point slowly began to press closer to his chest. It cut through his vest. He could feel the prick in the skin of his chest. As he gasped and growled, then shoved with all his might, he could muster with his left hand, and then he let go with his right, feeling it sink another inch in. But with his right hand free now, he reached up to grab the rock on the ground beside him, from bringing it up, smashing it into the side of his brother's face. His brother cried in pain as he was knocked off of him, and the knife came free in the gunslinger's chest, blood dripping from the cut. The gunslinger seized the knife then, rolling over the top of the man that he had once loved as his only blood, and plunged it straight into the man's chest as he tried to do to the gunslinger. His brother gasped and his eyes wide and his hands weakly grabbing the gunslinger's shoulders. The gunslinger panted softly as he sat there trying to catch his breath, as he watched as his brother slowly gasped his last. But then, to his surprise, his brother laughed softly and he coughed up a bit of blood. You don't get to lead this life. You don't get to leave. I won't be the last, but this, 
This gave my men in the well enough time. He trailed off, and then for a moment, and even the light in his eyes grew dumb, and he laughed softly in the gunslinger's face. The gunslinger's eyes were wide as he quickly stood up, opening the cover on the well pump to see the lock that had been broken. Someone had climbed down into it. His attention turned to the homestead. There was a blast of a shotgun. No! He screamed. Another shotgun blast and two pistol shots. No! He screamed harder, still as he began to run towards the house. His burning lungs, his tired legs, his wounded shoulder, all forgotten in the echo of the gunfire. Just as he reached the edge of the door and slammed into the... He cried in pain. It was barricaded from the inside, and he pounded hard with his left shoulder, desperately shoving, trying to open it as he heard another blast from a shotgun and one more pistol shot inside. No! He screamed louder still, with every bit of breath in his lungs, tears streaming down his face as he did. Finally, he shoved the door open enough to claw his way inside. His eyes needed a moment to adjust to the suddenly dark interior. But when they did, the sight that awaited him was a grisly horror of his darkest nightmare. His wife faced down, a puddle of blood seeping out around her body. His son's chest opened by buckshot, laid in the corner of the room. And his baby girl behind the table, who had been knocked onto the side for cover, blood dripping from her lips and the holes in her chest. The trapdoor at the back of the house was open, and three dead men lay around it. Pa! His eyes focused on the girl then as he rushed to her side. Dropping to his knees, he pulled her torso into his chest, cradling her head gently. He could see holes in her shirt where the buckshot had torn through it. Wasn't a doctor in the world that could do a thing for her now. I'm here, darling. He was all he could muster with a whisper. She coughed up a bit more blood then, and she looked up at him. I shot him. I hit something. The tears were stinging his eyes now as he shook his head, stroking her hair with one hand. Shh, you gotta rest now. Don't speak, he urged, as if he could change anything. She weakly tried to reach up for him, her lips moving, and no words came out. Then he heard a creak at the door and his eyes moved. There in the doorway was the priest. No, he gasped out, no! He whined, shaking his head hard as he clutched his daughter to his chest. But the figure in black cassock and the red sash walked towards him, ignoring his plea. No! He screamed then, letting go of his daughter reaching out, and grabbed the shotgun from one of the dead men clustered around the trap door. He leveled it at the priest who was still slowly walking across the room towards. He pulled the trigger. Click! The pulled the trigger again. Click! The gunslinger screamed as he threw the shotgun at the priest, but it sailed through him. No! He screamed louder, but then the priest was upon him. The figure kneeled down, and for the first time, the gunslinger could see his face through the black shroud. It was a skull with eyes like distant stars. I'm here to collect. I was supposed to be me. This wasn't what I agreed to. It was supposed to be me. Everything. Not them. The gunslinger screamed in the face of the stranger. Then he misunderstood what everything means. With that, the figure set his hand on the dying girl's eyes, closing them for the last time. Her body went stiff for a moment and faded away as the gunslinger sobbed and cried. He tried to reach out with her body and turned to a wispy smoke pulled into the mouth of the skull that the priest's head. But it slipped through his fingers like the wind. Then the priest turned to do the same to the gunslinger's wife and boy. The gunslinger himself just curled into a ball crying sobbing, his world ending around him. They are in my hands now. They shall be waiting for you. As soon as the priest said that, the gunslinger looked up and lunged across the floor to grab the pistol that he had in his son's hands. He pulled it into his head and pulled the trigger. Click. He pulled again. Click. He screamed and tossed the gun aside. He picked up another of the shotguns on the floor, jamming the barrel under his chin, and he reached down as far as he could to pull the trigger. Click. He tossed it aside, and he staggered into the kitchen, while the priest slowly followed. He sat his right hand on the chopping block and picked up a cleaver. He took a few deep breaths, and he brought the cleaver down as hard as he could. 
With a scream of pain, he severed his right hand at the wrist. Blood came pouring out for a moment, but then he screamed louder, as if the red-hot irons had suddenly been jammed through the stump of his wrist and the bones of his hand grew, and the flesh and the whole shape without any sinew, muscles, or flesh to hold them there, just floating. Come now, you must know that your life can only be claimed by a bullet with your name on it. As the priest said that, the gunslinger slapped his chest, feeling for where he'd placed the bullet earlier. But it wasn't there. He turned for the eternally grinning skull, and the priest then saw the bullet in his hand. And I shall give it to you when I'm ready. With that, it was all of the energy, hatred, rage, and hope, and light was sucked out of the gunslinger, who slumped on the floor once more looking up the figure before him. He felt hollow, entirely empty in that moment. Why? Because I am in need of a man like you. Do your job well, and they shall be taken care of most handsomely. This I promise. The priest set one of his gloved hands across his heart, bowed, and was gone with a slight rustle as the wind blew through the house. By the time the gunslinger emerged from the house once more, the sun won the orange silver in the horizon. The flies had begun to buzz. The buzzards had come for their fall. The red blood had pulled and begun to dry. He had a glove on his right hand now. He slowly picked up with the bodies until he got to the clocker that had been blasted apart in the fight. He reached down and groaned as he hefted the body up over his shoulder and began to walk. His job wasn't done. He wasn't sure when he would ever be done. While well, the three that meant everything to him were lost, there was at least one debt he at least might as well pay. In the distance behind him, watching from further up the mountain, the priest watched as his new gunslinger carried the broken corpse of the clocker off. He pulled a bullet from his belt and slowly turned it over in his gloved hand, thumb rubbing over the name etched into the side. One day the gunslinger would get that bullet back, but not before the priest got another bullet. An older, still with a different name etched into the side. A bullet with his name on it. And that's why he needed the gunslinger. So that he may finally know the peace that the gunslinger now sought. A peace that he had been looking for, for a very long time. With that, he tucked the bullet back into his belt, and the priest was gone, leaving the gunslinger alone in the world once more. Crocker on his back and the journey began anew. A debt on his shoulders that he must repay. And now, my friends, is the end of this Reddit quickie. I hope that you enjoyed. If you'd like to support the channel or the author, all the stuff is down below. And as always, I hope that you guys have a good one, and I'll see you in the next story. Cheers.